everyone, and welcome to the June 13th meeting of the Fiscal Management Committee. Um, my name is Lynn Harris, the chair, and right now I will first uh, go around with the introduction, starting with my fellow committee members, um, Dr. Daka. Good, good morning. And Mr. Do Dr. Joftis. Good morning. And then the uh, MCPS staff uh, joining us today. Um, and I'm just looking at my screen, so I'll start uh, with uh, Mr. Riley. Good morning, everyone. Rob Riley, Associate Superintendent of Finance. And Ms. Alfonso Windsor. Good morning, everybody. Yvonne Alfonso Windsor, uh, Budget Supervisor. And Ms. Bergstresser. Good morning, everyone. MJ Bergstresser, Supervisor, Internal Audit Unit. And Mr. Klausing. Good morning, uh, Tom Clausing, Assistant to the Associate Superintendent of Finance. And Mr. Johnstone. Good morning, Rick Johnstone, Director of Benefits. And Ms. Webb. Good morning, Laura Christina Webb, Chief of Staff for the Board. And uh, first item 2.1 on the agenda, any issues with the informational summary from our last meeting on March 21? Um, first thing, I am going to make a motion to amend our current agenda to move items 3.1 and item 6.1 uh, to the end of the meeting. Uh, Mr. Adams, our director of facilities, is presenting on those items, and he is uh, at one of our MCPS elementary schools uh, watching his son's fifth grade promotion. So um, I, is there a second? Second. All in favor? And that is unanimous. So we will move those two items and get started. Uh, the uh, first item then will be under our budget review section, uh, item 3.2, looking ahead to our FY24 operating budget process. So I can kick us off here. And uh, in the Office of Finance, you know, uh, everything we do is cyclical. So as you know, we're, we're really just wrapping up our FY23 budget. But uh, we'll be heading into FY24 as of July 1st. Uh, so what we do in each of these, whether it be our financial reporting processes, um, uh, our audit processes, we, we try to look at lessons learned. And, and I'm going to have uh, uh, Mr. Klausing speak to that of what our plans for uh, the FY24 operating budget process are. So, Tom. Thank you, Rob. So if we could bring up the PowerPoint and go to the next page. So less than a week ago, board members, you adopted the FY23 operating budget that starts on July 1. Uh, no sooner than we pretty much finalize the FY23 budget, we begin our internal planning for the development of the 24 budget. So in July of each year, so July 22, a budget guide will be issued by the um, budget unit and uh, issued to the offices and MCPS with information and instructions for preparing their budget submission, this being the FY24 budget. Then the budget unit holds orientation sessions, typically in August, with the offices to answer questions, to go over changes uh, since they last submitted their budgets, uh, and we'll talk about at least one of those in a little bit. So then the offices submit their budgets to the Office of Finance in September. And then in past years around that time in September, the Superintendent's Budget Advisory Committee would begin to hold a series of meetings to uh, discuss the, the budget. And then here's, here's the change I was referring to. So uh, a couple years ago, the county has required uh, agencies to include a racial equity and social justice statement in budget submissions, in supplemental budgets, and in the annual budget submission. Uh, we've typically met that requirement by uh, the superintendent in her memo to the board in February, uh, providing a, a review chapter by chapter of racial equity and social justice how that's being met in the budget for each of those chapters. But we're gonna to try to do something different this year in FY24. We're gonna move that process up. So when the superintendent submits her 
operating budget for FY24 to the board in early December, that budget itself will include those racial equity and social justice statements. So it'll it'll put them up front and uh, something that the board can review and discuss much earlier than it has in the past. Next slide, please. So now let me talk about the budget advisory committee and, and uh, the changes that are going to happen for FY24. So the, we're going to maintain an expanded membership uh, uh, that represents a broad community involvement. We uh, last year had upwards of 10 MCPS students be involved in the budget advisory committee, and they, they add a, a valuable uh, perspective to the discussion. And typically, the budget advisory committee would begin meeting in September of each year. Uh, but this year, we're going to start having those meetings earlier. And by hol holding meetings uh, possibly in late July or August, uh, we're going to be able to hold more committee meetings than we've held in previous years. That's one thing we heard uh, from a survey that uh, we had conducted at the end of the last budget advisory committee process that the the committee really wanted to meet more often. And so starting earlier, we'll be able to hold more meetings. And um, in lieu of uh, the virtual meetings that we've done the last two years because of the pandemic, we're uh, planning to meet personally uh, starting uh, this July or August. And with those in-person meetings, we're gonna be able to provide more backup material and information to the committee. And that's one thing they've asked for as well. And so um, the, that will then uh, allow us to also begin the discussion of a new program budget that uh, we've talked about reinstituting the program budget that we had done for several years, but, but stopped doing it a few years ago. Um, the, we want to begin that process of what should that new program budget look like? What are the programs that we we certainly want to address and, and capture the resources for? And uh, we'll we'll do that in part through discussions with the budget advisory committee. Next slide, please. So one thing to think about for FY24 is that um, there's going to be a new maintenance of effort calculation, as there has been for the last couple of years because of the pandemic. But the calculation for fiscal 24 is going to be different than the past couple of years. Uh, it's going to look at average enrollment over the FY 2018 through FY 22 time frame to determine the minimum level of funding that Montgomery County has to provide MCPS. And keep in mind too that uh, the FY24 budget will need to annualize or provide the full year costs of the negotiated agreements for fiscal 23 and uh, more than likely hold a, include a placeholder for agreements to be reached for fiscal 2024. And then finally, um, we need to begin to prepare for what, what we've been mentioning, uh, the fact that ESSER uh, funding is expiring uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, so that's referred to as the fiscal cliff. ESSER 1 will have expired by the time we're meeting in the fall here. ESSER 2 will expire in FY24, which is actually September of 2023. And then ESSER 3 will, which is the largest of the three ESSER grants, uh, that will expire in September of 2024 or the beginning of FY25. So those programs and efforts being funded by ESSER, we need to have that discussion about what programs should continue and uh, be funded in the operating budget. So those discussions will have to uh, occur over, uh, over due time. So that is the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, uh, I'll open it up for any questions or comments the board members may have. Thank you, Mr. Klausing. So I will look to my uh, uh, fellow board members' questions. Yeah, um, on slide four, um, 
using the average enrollment, is that a positive thing for us? Good question, Dr. Daka. Um, so uh, just mm -hmm. prior to the pandemic, our enrollment was increasing by by a thousand students, uh, and I'm sorry, 2000 students roughly for a 10 year period uh, to just prior to the pandemic, then um, MCPS was impacted greatly by the pandemic. Uh, we lost several thousand students now. Um, and so the um, enrollment uh, in September of 2020 really showed that big drop of students. And then it dropped again in September of 2021. We've seen a gradual improvement or students coming back to the system. And uh, we expect our numbers to be up in 2022 to make uh, you know, a, a precise answer or to, you know, to get to your point. Yeah, it, it does help us because of that growth that we've had, particularly in fiscal 18 and fiscal 19 will help us, um, but it'll be offset by those students that we lost. But, but uh, with the inclusion of September of 22 enrollment, that, that will certainly help us. Okay, thank you. I was uh, I knew that we had that drop in enrollment, and I didn't know how that was going to affect us. I know we were concerned about the budget related to that. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Harris. Um, Mr. Clausing, uh, could you say a little bit more? So my understanding uh, for the budget for next year, um, based on projected county revenues, is that we should not expect um, the same level, the same ability to go beyond maintenance of effort as we requested and mostly received for, for this year. Is that accurate? Is my understanding correct? And if, can you just put a little more details around that? Well, one of the factors that um, influences or affects the funding that the county can provide MCPS is the county's projections for its own revenue uh, from property taxes and 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 the like. And and so um, you know, we we typically ask for a budget that we need each year, um, recognizing that the county has its limits limits based on its um, current taxing policies. So um, um, I've not seen the latest update uh, uh, of the fiscal plan for the county. Um, they typically do one in early June and um, then also it's updated in December and then it's uh, updated again in March when the county executive puts out his or her budget. Um, and what's interesting is that it usually starts conservatively in June and then it has a better outlook in December and then even a better outlook in March. And so uh, even if the county's uh, projections um, don't reflect considerable revenue growth uh, in June, uh, the number should go up later in the year. So I guess what I'm thinking of, what, what I've heard are certainly some concerns about um, uh, county revenue um, over the next couple of years. And when you couple that with um, what you talked about, annualizing the um, teacher salaries and the, the um, uh, other commitments in the Maryland blueprint, and then the cliff with ESSER, it seems like as a board, we need to start thinking about using our funds as impactfully as possible, right? So I guess, my question is, to what degree do we as a board need to request from the district under, um, impact analysis of different types of programs so that assuming that our, our, there are some revenue shortfalls that we're prepared to use those resources in the most effective way possible? Yeah, and that's a great question. And one of the things that Mr. Klausing mentioned was the incorporation of the program budget. Um, and just like you said, we're going to have to um, analyze at a program level, um, especially as we come to the ESSER cliff. 
uh, because because we are going to be dealing with a limited number of uh, amount of funds as we head into the next couple of years, uh, knowing that things are going to remain tight, um, just as they were this year. I mean, we were uh, grateful that the county did find almost everything that we had asked for, um, but we don't know if that's going to continue. So we are going to be looking for the board's uh, um, advice and as, as we look at these particular programs. So I guess I'm asking a little bit more specific of a question, which is, um, you know, the board has, you know, only so much capacity to do kind of our own looking at programs. So I guess I'm asking about a recommendation from the administration about how we can ensure that the that sort of impact analysis on ESSER and other types, other funded programs um, are, are are occurring. Obviously, we can't do it on everything, but um, do we as a board need to um, have a resolution or um, how, how do we ensure that we're making those types of uh, wise decisions in the event? Well, either way, but certainly in the event if um, if budget is not where we're hoping it to be. Yeah, I guess uh, I think the point to your question is you want to know sooner than later, right? Because, you know, these discussions will be brought up at at the budget work sessions. Um, but at that point, uh, you know, and, and I guess be prior to that, we really still don't know, because as we entered this year, our state funding was, you know, we weren't sure. So there was a lot of questions there. Um, but to keep you guys informed, keep the board informed of where we're at, where we see areas where we might have to um uh, look at potential areas where we can kind of um, cut to make room for other more effective programs. Is, is right. that? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm asking a slightly different question. I know you get, you will give us the um, projections as soon as you have them, and we'll make some recommendations. I guess, and this may be for others that I we need to be asking this question. I guess my question is more: Are you confident that we have systems in place that are going to be able to keep the board and our our uh, public informed as to what programs should continue to be funded and maybe even expand and which um, which may need to be thought about um, you know either reducing or or even eliminating if they're not if they're not effective. So again, that may be a question for somebody else uh, outside of the fiscal management team, but um, I do want to make sure that we we have that kind of system in place and that. Um, the board has that kind of information available to it to make those kinds of decisions. Dr. Jo Dr. Joftis, if I if I might just say that that I think that that's a conversation that we should have with the Office of Shared Accountability. I mean, they they have um, program evaluations that they do, and I know at some point that they had a system by which they decided because like us they can't do it all decided which programs um, they were going to evaluate and so I think as we think about it in relation to the funding it, it will be important to have those conversations yeah I, I kind of thought that's what you were getting at but are we assessing our programs and we've been asking that question for quite a while to make sure that the ones that really work are the ones that we continue to use and if I may, uh, I know that, you know, we've been working with Share Accountability to make sure that they're evaluating the virtual academy, the summer programs, and all the other programs that we have in the ESSER 3, uh, you know, in addition to our regular programs, just to determine, you know, the feasibility, the impact, and so on um, for that, you know, in anticipation of that funding cliff. And although it's a broader question, we can actually bring it back to the next uh, fiscal management committee to show you where we're at. Um, from a fiscal management committee standpoint. That's great. Thank you all. And Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Harris, I, I feel like we should maybe as a committee consider some type of re um, drafting of some type of resolution that we bring to the full board that just makes this very clear that we always need this information, right? Any good system, any type of good organization needs to be understanding impact return on investment um, but it strikes me that um this time is this time pe time period is really critical that we have a good understanding um because we're putting a lot of investments out there with the hope that they're addressing the needs of our students and families so thank you i'm 
I'm done. And uh, thank you, Dr. Joftis. I, I think that is actually an excellent idea because it does get to themes that we've been talking about. Um, I think, you know, Dr. Daka is, you know, who is senior to both of us and her in time served uh, on the board has mentioned, you know, this is something that we've been kind of asking for for a while. And um, I think it will help us to the extent to which some of our, our conversations around budgets become much more challenging, especially as the ESSER funding goes away. And we're looking at something like a virtual academy and bringing new schools online and, you know, looking at um, whether the enrollment shift from in-person instruction to virtual academy is enough to allow us to maintain the expenses, the expenditures on both ways. Because what we, I think, assumed is that enough students would be moving from in per, the choice for in-person to a preference for virtual learning um, that we that would offset um, the staffing requirements and things like that overall. Um, but I think you also raised what I thought was a very interesting point in last, I think it was late winter uh, at the board table about perhaps um, looking at the landscape around virtual instruction in the state. I know the governor's veto of the um, of the of the bill that um, would have uh, kind of put flesh on the bones of virtual instruction going forward. Um, and now we are in a place where um, they're saying uh, currently, because this is the last year of the governor's term, so the legislature can't override that veto. So the bill is going to have to come back to the General Assembly next January. Um, but right now we can't plan for a virtual kindergarten. Um, so we have some that all of these kind of moving parts. And so the kind of oversight and measurement and accountability of our programs, I think is going to be really, really important um, going forward. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I do have just a couple quick questions. First one, looking at, and this is a follow-up to Dr. Daka. Um, so we're now, instead of uh, building our, our, our per pupil, you know, maintenance of effort funding requirement um, based on our actual enrollment, for at least this year, for the next fiscal, we're going to be looking at that 2018 to 22 average. And do we know when that number will be calculated, and when it's going to be set, so we know what the what the per pupil expenditure is going to be? I can try to answer that, uh, Ms. Harris. So, um, as you know, um, September of 20 of each year, uh, September 30th is when MCPS and other LEAs um, finalize their official enrollment, but it takes several weeks after that. It's typically in early November that the sorting out of uh, that official enrollment takes place. Sometimes students are on our roles and they're also on Frederick County roles. And so that, that sorting out occurs over, over a few weeks. So um, before the superintendent submits her budget in December, sometime in November, we'll have a better estimate of what the minimum level under the new MOE law will, will um, uh, come out to be. And Dr. Daka made a good point that, um, yes, we had growth in 18 and 19 in our enrollment, but I think it was like 7,000 students over, over uh, 20 and 21 that we lost. And, and again, the students are coming back um, I, I wish I could uh, tell you what the enrollment would be for this September 30th, um, but that's going to be a critical number, too, in the calculation. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to uh, reiterate what you said about September 30th. That's when all the schools and the teachers have to submit their roles for that time. And we really don't know until after the 30th how many kids we actually have back. Yeah, and I think one of the things too, and I'm, I'm assuming we're, we're monitoring a little bit of trend data here, but um, this year in particular, um, given the change in um, administration at the federal level, we saw a, a pretty steady influx of, of newcomer students to the system. And, um, but that was throughout the school year. And so looking at those trends over time, and I don't know how that helps us or not, but I mean, I guess it sort of helps us to get a sense for even after we finalize those numbers on September 3rd and then the sorting process with all of our LEAs is, is finalized. Um, you know, 
we still see students entering the system. And this year we had a lot of students enter the system after that September 30 deadline. So I don't know if that trend is gonna continue, but something for us to keep our eyes on. And if I just, sorry. No, go ahead. No, if I just may add, um, we have a pretty good estimate before the superintendent's budget, but we don't have real final numbers until the state releases their state aid numbers. And, you know, enrollment numbers, farms and all of that play a huge part of state aid. So we really won't have the full impact until we get the governor's budget in end of January, you know, beginning of February. And then just a couple questions I have about the budget advisory committee. Um, and I know, uh, you know, I, in the, historically, I, I sat on that committee multiple times and I know it has, um, its work has, has varied over time. And so I'm just, um, one of the things that was a challenge was the requirement that if you were talking about an organizational representative to that advisory, that one individual was designated, they had to commit to attending all the meetings and there could be no substitution. So if I took that seat, but I had a date that I was unable, had an unavoidable conflict, I could not have somebody else come in and, and take my place for that meeting. Um, have, has, how are we handling that, especially as we look to recruit the membership for that uh, budget advisory committee now that you're expanding it? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I, I, I'll throw my two cents, Tom, and then you can uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong. But um, the, that mandatory um, commitment, um, when I first came on, I, I don't believe we had that, um, but we did have the ability for uh, you know representatives to substitute, uh, knowing that we wanted as many folks you know there to be able to, to kind of get that message to members um, as soon as possible. So um, we're, we are expanding, but at the same time, not mandating attendance. Uh, but just a, a point I want to make what Tom had mentioned too, uh, you know, there's benefits of doing things virtually, but we had said uh, one of the things that came up last year was that uh, in previous years, when it was in person, um, the members kind of liked the binder they had. And Ms. Harris, I don't know if you remember that binder, but that's how you kind of build upon that knowledge. Not saying that you can't do that virtually, um, but I did hear that, and we are going to do the, the binders again this year, how you kind of uh, bring in that information and put it right in that binder. So it's always uh, at your hand at, you know, you have it at a moment's notice. Tom, I don't know if you want to add to our, you know, what we're looking at uh, with regards to uh, mandating attendance or, you know, how we're going to address that. Well, I, I remember what uh, Ms. Harris is referring to that uh, um, back several years ago, we, we really insisted that um, uh, there be a single point of contact, a single representative from, from these organizations. But I think we've come around to thinking that it's more important to have the organization represented. So if someone was the appointee, but couldn't attend, it was important that the voice of, of uh, all, all the um, um, customers that we have, our community-based uh, organizations, uh, have a voice at the table. And so, uh, as Rob says, uh, we've not required that like we did in the past, that it be a single person. I appreciate that. And I'd, I'd say, too, um, you know, I appreciate the um, kind of your expanded look at, at making these more in-depth, um, because the one thing we want to um, address is some folks who sat on these over the past couple of years feeling like um, they weren't really sure how valuable their participation was. And so, you know, in our PR, as we go out to recruit these members, we really want to encourage, we really want to focus in on how valuable that input is. Um, and, the, and then another question I really appreciate, you know, it was an ongoing poll to get students a seat at that table when, you know, I believe that there are customers and you need your customers if you're going to know how to run your business as successfully as you can. Um, but so how are we, and if back to the in-person piece, so most of these meetings are during the day when students have academic obligations in their schools. And um, a lot of these students, um, you know, they don't drive transportation could be a challenge and we don't want to preclude participation because of, you know, a student at Damascus can't get to Carver. For the meeting. So will there be an opportunity for the students in particular to participate virtually to make sure it is an equitable opportunity and we, we maximize their ability to participate given the timing of these meetings? Yeah, that's a great point. And um, 
when we say in, in person, I, I think our intention is to make it hybrid, uh, you know, for the most part in person, but have that uh, available. And, and last year, um, as, as Tom mentioned, we, we were going to in, increase the number of meetings that we had, but the meetings that we had with students, we intentionally uh, uh, scheduled them for 6 p.m. You know, we, we had evening uh, times as well, too. So we'll be considerate of that as we open it up to even more students this year to make sure that uh, they are attending and they, they their input was definitely valuable last year. So we're looking forward to that as well. Yeah, and I would say too, I mean, I'm not clear. Were you saying that you had student only budget advisory meetings or you scheduled some of the budget advisory meetings in the evening to accommodate students? Um, we had at least two uh, that were to accommodate them, but we did actually do, did do an introductory budget advisory committee specifically for students to kind of catch them up with, with our acronyms and, and some of the things that other budget advisory committee members might have already been aware of. So we had a specific meeting for them and then we included them, uh, uh, were able to include them by by you know arranging the hours of the, the, the regular meetings. Yeah, I appreciate that. Because I really think it's important for everyone to hear the perspective of students since they they're the ones that live it every day in our buildings along with the staff. So um, thank you very much. Any other questions on, on this piece of the, here we go again, buckle up for FY24 operating budget. You're right, it never ends. It never ends. The budget cycle never ends. Okay. Then moving on, um, our next uh, agenda item is uh, 4.1, the employee health plans and the RFP that went out this spring um, around our kind of cyclical process of updating what we do. Um, and I think um, we're turning this over to Mr. Johnstone. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Rick Johnstone, Director of Benefits uh, over here at uh, Employee and Retiree Service Center. So after a couple of the closed sessions, uh, Mr. Riley had asked that uh, we put together sort of a high level review of the RFP or request for proposal process, um, the rate uh, renewal process that we have each year on our benefit plans, uh, and then also the plan management uh, discussion. So if I could have the, the presentation uh, up, please. Thank you. And that's what we're going to be uh, discussing this morning. So if we could go to the, the next page, please. Now I'm going to apologize up front. My allergies are kicking up. So if I do uh, <clears throat> cough or have to clear my throat, it's just allergies. So um, the medical request for proposal process or RFP uh, is something that uh, the Employee and Retiree Service Center does uh, every three to five years. And basically we try to balance uh, stability for our employees and our retirees with a vendor, with also enhancements uh, that are realized in the industry uh, that run about every four to five years. So we, we balance that process out with stability to go out to the marketplace um, and sort of price test and plan test our benefits uh, with other vendors. The process does include other Montgomery County agencies. Um, this past process included uh, WSSC, uh, the college, and I believe uh, park and planning. We used to have uh, Montgomery County government uh, as part of that group process, but they had selected a different um, uh, benefits uh, consultant, and so they had to keel off and, and go on their own for that. Um, this is a, a rather lengthy process. We actually begin this uh, usually in January of, of a year because it takes about four to six months uh, for the bids to go out to our vendors, for them to put together proposals, the analysis of those proposals. And these are usually two or three binders thick for each vendor. Uh, so it is rather robust as far as the amount of information that we receive. Um, and that's why it takes about four to six months. We have a scoring process. Uh, whereby we look at the technical aspects of a vendor, what they're capable of doing, what they're bringing to the table, uh, as well as the pricing uh, or the cost considerations. We utilize Aon uh, consultants. Uh, they are an outside independent agency uh, that uh, assist us with the review process and also the consolidation of data. Uh, and then as we go through that review process with our uh, agency partners, uh, and our uh, association partners, um, we do have an independent review on this so that whatever MCPS uh, is deciding or leaning towards, we're not tied with the other agencies. Each agency 
can make their own uh, selection uh, and it's independent with respect to all the other agencies. So we're not bundled in with an all for one, if you would approach on that. Um, following that scoring and the review process, we have what's called a best and final. And that's where the vendors uh, we bring in for sort of their, their last uh, approach on this with any enhancements that they wish to, to offer. Uh, we incorporate that into the scoring and then end up with the finalist who we notified and then begin that uh, uh, renewal process. If it includes a change, uh, we also wanna allow enough time and that's why we do start this rather early because if we do make a change with a vendor, uh, we have to incorporate those changes in our system. So we've got to change the file setup that we are sending back and forth every month with our vendors, uh, sometimes uh, uh, multi-times within a month. And we also have to change our communications so that uh, it's reflective of a new vendor and to educate our employees uh, on that. I wanna stress that um, the, the process that we go here, uh, we are actually putting forth our benefit plans that we've negotiated with our associations for a vendor to quote on. Uh, they are not coming back with their program, they are quoting on our program. So when we talk about the employee co-pays or the benefit designs that we have built in to the programs, uh, those are the MCPS benefits that are negotiated and the vendors are quoting on our program for us. So. Uh, if we do make a change, uh, we aren't talking about changes to co-pays or benefit designs. It is only the vendor who is managing our programs, paying the claims, um, answering the phone uh, banks that they have with employee and retiree questions, uh, and the plan management that we have for our, our employees and retirees. So I'll stop here for a second on, on this part if there are any questions from the members um, on this aspect. Uh, Dr. Joftis, Dr. Daka, any questions for Mr. Johnston? Not, no, uh, thanks. Yeah, and I would just ask, um, so uh, one of the things that you mentioned, Mr. Johnston, is this is a process that we, uh, we go through every three to five years. Is, and this is just because we want to make sure that we are providing the best benefits package we can to our employees and retirees, or is that industry practice? It's a combination uh, of, of, of many things. One is, is to sort of um, uh, do a check on the pricing because there are changes uh, from time to time on the pricing or the administrative fees that, that we are paying for these programs to be run, but also for any advancements uh, that may have occurred in the industry, whether it be medical or prescription or dental or vision um, that we wanna be able to look at and take advantage of for our populations. So it's a combination of pricing and the actual plan management that we're looking at. And, and I just want to emphasize something that you said, because it was something that was discussed um, with the board, as you, you said, we've had a couple of conversations about this. And I think even among us, there was, I, it was, there was some, uh, I don't think we fully understood your process. And it was good to hear that the, the, the plan benefits that are offered are not the product of what the vendors provide but are the product of what the employee and retiree benefits group and our associations together create. And then that is what is that, that, that plan, those benefits are what are put out for bid. And I think just emphasizing what you said, because that was definitely something that was not well understood. It certainly wasn't well understood by me and I'm a former teacher. So um, I very much appreciate understanding that process better. Sure. Okay. Okay, can we do the next page then, please? Okay, so our renewal rate process was another question that had come up uh, on this. Um, MCPS with um, some of our plans, we are self-funded. And so that means that we actually are, are paying the claims, uh, not us, but actually the vendors that we hire. Um, and so we want to go through what that renewal process is. So each year uh, we look at the, the plan cost uh, as we have gone through the past uh, 12 months and we establish the upcoming rates during open enrollment for the upcoming plan year. So the renewal rates, I want to make clear, are, are not negotiable. 
Uh, these are the actual costs that, that MCPES incurs. And they're a combination of, of three things. Uh, one are the administrative fees, which I referenced uh, just before with the RFP process. That's about 5%, uh, 5 to 6% roughly of the total cost that we incur. So that is the, the fee that we are paying the vendors to pay our claims, have a network of providers, uh, to uh, have the plan management and case management programs available for our employees, retirees, and their families, um, to answer the phone calls that come in and, and to provide assistance for our population. A second part, which is the overwhelming part of, of our plan expense, are claims. Uh, and that's about 95% of the total cost. So all the claims that, that employees and retirees and their families incur throughout the year are pulled together uh, as a total and then are looked at as far as a trend. And that's the last component. Uh, there is inflation as we're all experiencing now, whether it be food or gas, well, there is inflation with respect to benefit cost. And that's the third component. So what are we looking at for the upcoming year as far as a trend? Um, medical plan inflation is different than standard CPI, uh, the consumer price index. Uh, it has its own costs. And this is basically, whether it be through technology advances uh, that are incurred, uh, whether it is the actual increase that doctor offices may have or labs have uh, for the ongoing expenses. And all three of these, administrative fees, claims, and trends are put together to come up with a projection for the upcoming plan year expenses. And those are the rates that we uh, put together uh, at the end of August uh, for our open enrollment that occurs in October. So we're working on our renewal process uh, starting in June with our vendors as far as open enrollment. Um, everything that our employees and retirees see in October, we've been working on for many months prior uh, so that we're ready to go. Uh, there's a lot of communications as you all uh, see, whether it be through the actual packets that we put together for retirees, or if it's online for our employees as far as the, the information that we provide in emails, through the four-year benefit, uh, through the uh, uh, e-pay stubs, and all the communication aspects, because we try to get uh, numerous uh, contact points for employees to make sure that they're aware of this. As we finalize the rates, uh, we do have discussions with the superintendent and also the Joint Employee Benefits Committee, that's the JEBC, uh, on the renewal rates. And the JEBC uh, is a group that meets every other month and they're members from the union presidents uh, and executive directors and their appointed members, as well as MCPS management. And we look at benefit related issues throughout the year. So uh, we advise them of what the rates are gonna be for open enrollment as a heads up, uh, and then put that information together, obviously for open enrollment and all the information that we have there for employees and retirees that occurs in October of each year. Um, we are going to, we've made a decision to have um, uh, in-person open enrollment fairs this year as we're starting to do uh, our orientations in person uh, and talking with our vendors. They've said that most organizations are going back to in-person. Uh, but last year we had a, a great reception with our online uh, support for employees. So we're also going to do those as well. So we will uh, reach out in person for open enrollment fairs. And that's where employees can actually come by to one of the locations, whether it be Carver or one of our schools that we visit uh, and meet with our vendors, talk with, with myself or my staff. Uh, but we'll also do this online because a lot of uh, individuals, whether it be because of their schedule, uh, if they're working or for retirees, if they're more comfortable uh, doing it from home, uh, really like the, the online support that we did there. So we're gonna do both this coming year. Uh, and see how that goes. So um, that is our renewal rate process that we have each year. Uh, and I will stop at this point for any uh, questions or concerns that, that uh, the committee has. Thank you. Um, so um, Dr. Daka, Dr. Joftis. Um, Mr. Johnson, I don't know whether you are going to be covering this um, in, a, in the future, but I know one of the big concerns that most of us have whenever we're switching uh, plans is whether we're able to keep 
our own doctor um, that we're currently that we're currently seeing. Can you can you talk about that? Sure. Um, part of the review process that we have when uh, I talked about the technical aspect component uh, is to look at what's called a disruption analysis. And so what we do is we take the existing vendors that we have and their provider network, and we compare that to the other vendors. So we go through that with Aon. Uh, they've got a database that pulls, because obviously for, for 22,000 employees and another 10,000 retirees, there are a lot of providers, um, whether it be your you know, OBGYN, whether it be your allergist, which I'm using a lot lately, um, uh, or lab and x-ray, and they do an overlap to see what's there. Uh, generally, what we aim for is somewhere in the 93 to 95% overlap, which means that 93 to 95% of the providers that we have in the existing network are matched by another plans network. Uh, if you get to that level, you are, are very comfortable uh, with that kind of transition. Uh, generally, if it goes anywhere below 90%, uh, then you've got some issues because uh, if 10% of your population or more are losing their, their providers, uh, there is a disruption that's there. So we try to limit that and keep that uh, target in the 93 to 95%. So um, I will also offer that even with the existing vendors, um, that you will have providers that drop out through the year, uh, whether it be because of retirements, uh, whether it be because they decided not to participate anymore with that specific vendor. So this is an ongoing process that all vendors have, um, whether you are remaining with a, a plan or making a change down the road. Um, we do work with our vendors so that if we do have uh, practices that are not part of a, a upcoming uh, change, that we let the, the new vendor know about them. Uh, and they will reach out to the provider to see if they would be willing to participate. But again, that decision resides solely with the provider. Um, they can be presented with the information uh, and what the reimbursement rates are, but that does reside with just that provider. Um, Dr. Daka, any questions about this? Um, and I guess I would just um, just put out there, I mean, I appreciate the very um, um, sort of regularization of this process. So annually, there's this rate setting that happens in a very uh, in a very specific way. And then every three to five years, in accordance with industry practice, the, the plan goes back out for bid just to, to do a, a check on, you know, are we keeping pace? So, but just to be clear, and uh, a little bit of follow up to Dr. Jopta, so here, we have both of those things happening, both the every three to five year RFP and the annual, you know, conversation around rates. And so we are making a change with vendors. So uh, maybe you could just talk a little bit about that, because even though this is a very regularized process, it's one that um, is as incredibly interesting and and, you know, sexy as it is, a lot of people don't pay attention to. Um, so they just take it for granted that this work is happening. Um, and so maybe you could just share a little bit about um, what the change is, um, because, you know, change makes people anxious. Sure. So so we're talking about specific change that we're talking about for this coming year. OK, so the review process that we had for the medical RFP uh, did wrap up uh, a number of weeks ago. And as a result of that review uh, with the technical aspect and also the pricing elements, um, the recommendation was to make a change to Cigna uh, coming for this coming year. And so that is being presented or, or being brought forth, I guess, for the board meeting uh, later on in June uh, with the financial aspects that that, that incorporates. Um, this isn't something that we take lightly. We understand for uh, employees and retirees that uh, change is you know, unsettling. Um, and uh, as Dr. Joftis had, had uh, raised, uh, when we did review uh, the comparisons, we did find that um, the Cigna plan was running at about 93 to 95% as far as an overlap on the uh, uh, provider network. So we're comfortable uh, that we've got a very high percentage of providers 
that were in the prior plan and will be uh, moving forward. Uh, the cost savings will be uh, uh, presented to the, the board later this month uh, so that there was uh, a, a fair amount of savings between the administrative side, uh, which I mentioned is, is only 5% of the total, but uh, a fair amount of savings there, as well as savings on the claim aspect. Um, that part is basically the, the discount, if you will, uh, or the pricing mechanism that a vendor has with their provider uh, network. And so the Cigna savings with their providers were slightly stronger than the uh, incumbent as far as their reimbursement levels to providers. What that means for our employees is they still pay the same copay when they see a, a, a primary care physician or a specialist, but it is the back half that's that, that cost for the office visit where we will realize a little more savings that we are paying being self-funded uh, with, with Cigna. And so the combination on that really had them step uh, aside from all the other vendors that we reviewed. Uh, and that was the recommendation that we're bringing forth towards the end of this month. Mm -hmm. um, we will be providing uh, discussions for our employees in our educational uh, meetings that we conduct for open enrollment. Uh, we walk through that uh, with our employees and with our association partners so that people uh, can go through and actually look up their, their actual providers. They'll be able to go on uh, and pull up their general practitioner, their allergist, their GP, um, and see if they're part of that network. And with a, a 93 to 95% overlap, uh, we're very comfortable that uh, it's on par with what we have right now for our, our populations. I also want to remind everyone that um, because our retirees are, are around the country, that Cigna is also a national program, uh, as Care First is. And so our retirees were also reviewed as far as where they live uh, and the provider networks that are available to them as well. So that, that 93 to 95% includes people who are living, you know, whether it be or retired in Florida or Massachusetts or Maine, wherever they are, we include our entire population in that review so that we're looking at the sum total, not just the folks who are in the DC metropolitan area. Um, yeah, uh, Ms. Harris, I do have another question. I, I know that you're saying 95% of the uh, providers, the medical people will be the same. Um, but we will not have to have our general practitioner uh, approve anything. We don't have to, I don't do that right now. I just go to the doctor that I need to go to. So that will continue. If you're, if you're referring to a referral. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. We, we do not have referrals. That's the part that that's our, our plan. So our plan says there are no referrals. And so when the vendors quote on our business, they are actually quoting on the plan design that we have and that we've negotiated with our association partners. Um, and there are no referrals for uh, our, our medical plans at all. You go to a specialist when and if you think you need to, or if your primary says, yes, you need to go there, you just select one uh, and, and go to them. I also wanted to, to mention too, and I think I did earlier, but I wanted to, to stress um, that our association partners we're also part of this review process with us um, in the review of the, the technical and pricing components. Um, so they also were part of that discussion and we had discussions with our JEBC uh, as a result as well. All right, if there aren't any further questions there, if we could turn to the, the last page. So this sort of hits on some of the, the points that we have been uh, discussing uh, all along, which does occur when we look at uh, an RFP and, and the plans. But I uh, want to just touch base with the, the plan management and design discussions. So um, our plan management and design discussions are held with JEBC, the Joint Employee Benefits Committee members throughout the year. Uh, we have meetings every other month. Um, and with that, we have internal discussions on uh, items of interest that are brought forth by the membership. Uh, that also includes our retiree association. Um, so things that may come up to their membership uh, committees, uh, we discuss, as well as we also bring in our vendors. 
uh, sort of a year in review, if you will. And so we look at how the plan performed in the prior 12 months. Uh, we look at claims, not individual claims, but as a composite uh, and trends that we are seeing. Uh, and then issues that, that they bring forth as far as plan management ideas uh, or things that are being developed in the industry that we might want to consider. Um, and so these are things uh, along the, the lines of diabetes management, cholesterol management and the like um, that are up for discussion and review uh, that we discuss and that are brought forth then with the negotiations that occur every couple of years between MCPS and our association partners. Our plan design issues, as I've mentioned, so our co-pays, our deductibles, and our medical management and our contribution levels are negotiable. And those are brought forth uh, every number of years in the negotiation process with our union partners for review and discussion. So um, the JBC is, is bringing forth these items um, for review. Uh, we sort of flush these things out. We'll bring in uh, experts uh, in those in those areas for further discussions. We also bring in Aon uh, uh, as our uh, sort of an independent uh, benefit consultant uh, to sort of look at ideas or thoughts that other school systems or other organizations uh, are contemplating or putting forth. And then those are brought forth to the negotiation table uh, to be pursued or not uh, between MCPS and the plans. But um, as has been uh, brought up here, uh, our actual design is something that we put out to our vendors and then they quote our plan design back to us as far as the, the administration and management. So um, they go by what our plan is and how we want it managed, not by what they offer because each vendor has hundreds upon hundreds of plans that they um, administer for various organizations and we want them to quote on our plan of what we're doing for our employees, uh, retirees, and their families. So if there's any questions on, on this aspect, we'd be glad to, to address those for you. Um, Dr. Dockin, uh, Dr. Joftis. Thanks, Ms. Harris. Um, so my, my understanding is that the cost to our employees is going up um, a little bit. Is that is that accurate? Well, there's there's two cost aspects. So one is the contributions, and those those are remaining the same, the 12% or the 17%, and those are the negotiated items. The non-negotiated items, items are the renewal process. So that's what our plan will be this coming year. Um, we established those rates in August. We try to get as much claim information as we can from the prior year so we can get as close as possible to the upcoming year's projections. So uh, in the beginning of August, we start pulling that information together. Uh, we review that, we look at the trends, those three parts that I mentioned, the administrative costs, the claims, and then the trend, we put together in August, and then we come back to JBC and the superintendent uh, with what those rates will be. So what we're expecting, uh, is that some of the savings that we're going to realize um, as a result of these negotiations with the vendors will help offset uh, projected plan increases. But until we get closer to August to try to narrow down to what those are going to be, um, we just sort of have an idea that, you know, the, the trending is increasing. There's no question about that. Um, but certain plans have different trends. So dental, for example, has a different trend than say medical or prescription. And so we take each of these individually and look at those uh, to come up with our rates for the coming year. Generally, we can say that, that in most years, plan costs do go up. And so there is an increase that the question is how much. Sometimes our prescription plan is, is uh, a little more stable, and so there hasn't been a jump. Um, a couple of years ago, when the, the hepatitis vaccine came out, um, we had a real jump in our plan expenses because there now was a cure to hepatitis B. That didn't occur before. Uh, that was managed on the medical side, and so those claims just continued year after year. But now, all of a sudden, there was a cure, and boom, we had uh, a lot of individuals who, who were able to take that vaccine and be cured, 
but our costs went up. So um, we take these as they come through. We, I think, did mention that, you know, COVID was something that we were not, um, you know, nobody was ready for. So your, your um, I don't want to say voluntary uh, uh, benefits, but your hip replacements or knee replacements were sort of put on hold during COVID because they didn't want people in the hospital uh, if you could get by. But our COVID costs went up because they didn't exist before. So that bubble is sort of pushed forward. Um, and so we will be able to, to give a, a better uh, target for you as we get closer to August with what those expenses are expected to be. So I, thank you. I, I think I, I think I know the answer to this, but you know, um, many of our employees got six plus percent increase uh, in their salaries. How do you respond to the concern that let's say our health care costs are going up two percent? How do you respond to the concern then that our what was a six point five percent salary increase was really a four point five or four percent increase? Sure. So so there there would be a reduction, but it's not a direct reduction. Um, you'd have to take the average salary of someone, um, and I don't know what that is off the top of my head, but uh, obviously for each uh, uh, group of individuals, it's going to be different. But you're looking at an annual salary versus a, a plan cost. Um, I think the, the plan cost on an annual basis for an individual is right around seven or 8,000. Uh, I'm going to say ballpark. And so you can't compare that increase to a, say, $60,000 salary. So it's, it's really apples and oranges. Yes, there's an offset uh, based on, on someone's salary increase, but it's not a direct uh, offset as far as the, the benefit increase in costs. So we do actually provide um, in our discussions with uh, uh, JBC and employees um, a, a direct uh, comparison to say that for someone making X dollars per year, uh, here was you know your step increase in COLA, and here's what this means on a per paycheck. And we actually provide examples on a per paycheck basis for an individual to say, okay, the difference is going to be an extra you know dollar fifty a paycheck or an extra four dollars a paycheck for your benefit costs for the upcoming year. Um, we do remind employees that that. Their contribution is 12 to 17 percent of the actual cost, whereas the board's um, is the overwhelming majority. So that is 88 percent down to 83 percent. Um, so that there is that differential as well. So we do uh, provide information uh, to employees and to our union partners with what those specifics will be as we come forward. But it's not a it's not a direct correlation. There is an offset, but it's just not a direct correlation. Thank you. Sure. Was there another question? I didn't know if I saw another hand. Dr. Duncan, I, and I would just follow that up a little bit because, um, you know, one of the things too that um, comes up is, you know, there's a cost sharing, as you just alluded to, Mr. Johnstone, where, you know, the system provides either 88 or 83% of the cost of the, of the plan, depending on which plan the employee chooses. Um, and that, that, arrangement that cost sharing is negotiated um, and frankly is a much more generous cost sharing than many other you know non-mcps um, em employees receive from through their employers so when is the last time that we that the cost sharing was was changed in mcps i th i think part of it was with our wellness offset but i want to say it was maybe three to five years ago, somewhere in that, it was more than three, uh, four or five years ago, I think, Rob, does that sound about right? Yeah, I think we're in the five or six range uh, when we are when we changed that 83, 88 um, cost share. Okay. Um, any other questions, Dr. Joptis, Dr. Daka? Okay, and I would just like to say thank you, um, because I think um, I, a lot of, we have a, we're a very large employer, we have a lot of employees and retirees, the, uh, but the work that you all do around benefits and services and, you know, finan analyze and anal financial analysis and fiscal health is ongoing year round. And, um, you know, people don't see, you know, it's like a duck. 
you know, the plans are up here sailing away, but the work to make them stay afloat is is happening really robustly under the surface. So um, uh, really appreciate um, the work that you all do just um, 365 days a year. Well, thank you. Okay, moving on to our next agenda item. Um, we are looking at 5.1 overview of our FY22 financial monitoring. And I think I'm tossing that to Rob, Mr. Riley. Yeah, I'll give a brief introduction. And this has come up at uh, board meetings as well, too. One of, you know, we were talking about processes and our annual processes. One of the most important is our financial monitoring process. Um, so I'm going to have uh, Ms. Alfonso Windsor go through it. Not only does her team uh, you know, lead or manage the effort to develop the budget, but they also work with specialists and folks all around the whole system to see where we are at on a budget to actual basis on a, on a monthly basis. Um, and part of the uh, importance is that if that is that, um, as you know, we use part of our year end savings to balance the subsequent year budget. So it's traditionally been 25 million. Um, next year, it's going to be, um, uh, or this year, it was 35 million. Um, so, uh, Ms. Alfonso Winslow can walk you through that process on how we get from a $3 billion budget to $35 million. It, it's, it's not easy and it takes a lot of work. So, uh, Yvonne. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I will walk you through the financial monitoring process if we can bring up the PowerPoint. Um, like Mr. Um, Riley mentioned, I think uh, financial monitoring is one of the most critical processes that we have. You know, it's um, it's something that we do that we live, you know, throughout the year. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So the financial monitoring is a process where we compare and we analyze our budget of resources and our actual spending. And we actually go down to the granular level, the specialists at the offices go down to the granular level by account, and then we do our reporting by category. So uh, the only thing I, I wanna clarify though, financial monitoring, uh, it's done for the general fund, the enterprises and the grants are done separately and differently. We keep track of them, but it's done differently. Mm -hmm. And the projections are made, like, like I said, by a state category, and we project for the remainder of the year. The whole goal is to make sure that uh, we uh, meet our financial obligations, like, you, like Mr. Riley mentioned. Uh, we are normally uh, have a $25 million fund balance that we have to account for for the following year's budget. And this year is going to be $35 million for the FY23 budget. So we're monitoring everything very carefully and, and closely every month. Uh, next page, please. And financial monitoring, it is so critical, not because we have to meet our only our financial obligations, but it's because we have a responsibility to be good stewards of the funding that taxpayers have entrusted us with. And we have to make sure that we may meet the priorities of, you know, ensuring that every student uh, gets, you know, um, it's, um, it's that every student is supported and uh, through the teaching and learning. And it also um, ensures that we meet the priorities that the Board of Ed and the administration of MCPS set, set for the follow for that year, uh, that we spend our funding the way it was intended to be spent. And we also make sure that we, you know, we don't spend more than that than is budgeted. So that's um, you know, that's critical. Next slide, please. So each year, um, traditionally, financial monitoring starts. It, uh, in October. So we report for the following month, for the month of September. And the reason that happens is because, as you all know, as schools begin in September, so all the salaries are encumbered, everything really comes into place, you know, in September. Um, so the first report of the fiscal year goes to the board in November and it's done. We do that process in October uh, for the month of September. Um, every month, um, Every office again goes back and reviews their projections and the mm -hmm. and the budget specialists review the projections as well. And then we provide an end of year summary with any categorical transfers uh, to the board of ed in August and then uh, to the county council and the county executive. Next slide, please. So like I've been mentioning, you know, we uh, in 
let's take, for example, October. In October, we closed the, the books as of September 30th, and then the account managers enter their projections in the financial monitoring system by the 10th of the, by the, 10th of the month. After that, the budget specialists review the projections and they look at historical trends. They look at you know in, any differences, and they contact uh, the offices to make sure that they understand where the projections are coming in, and that we are going to end up the fiscal year as close as possible to what we are projecting. After that, uh, after the budget team has had a uh, time to do that, then we report to the associate superintendent of finance, Mr. Riley, and the chief of finance and operations in the third week of the month. By that time, we have finished our projections. Then the next step is reporting to the superintendent and the chiefs uh, by the end of the month. Uh, once all that is reported and reviewed with the executive leadership, then we provide, we finalize the projections and we provide the monthly financial report to the board uh, during the following month. Next slide, please. So beginning in this year, we started to include an overview of the ESSER funding by state category um, during the for uh, in the in the financial monitor in the financial monthly report. And the reason for that, why we do it for the ESSER and not for any other grants, is because, as you all know, ESSER, you know, it's almost five hundred million dollars uh, that we have in ESSER. And it's really helping us uh, through all the priorities and all the initiatives that we have in place and have to keep in mind that that fiscal cliff that we keep referring to. Um, this year, the initial financial reporting September, uh, we were projecting an end of the year balance of $20.5 million. And then by the February, we had increased that to $24.2 million. Obviously, when we start, the office is starting September looking at their projections, you know, they're, they're, they're being a little more conservative. They're trying to make sure that everything that they have to do will get done. And then by February, you know, we have actual expenditures for half the year and we know we're, you know, we're closer to the end of the, the fiscal year. Um, the expenditure balance that you see in the monthly financial report uh, looks at the expenditures plus, plus any revenue and surplus or deficits and, you know, to make sure that we meet that $25 million financial obligation. Um, in March of this year, uh, the county executive, when he um, announced his budget, he was recommending a $45 million uh, fund balance at the end of this year instead of the $25 million. And they were saying that we should use fund, you know, you use ESSER to meet that $45 million fund balance. Uh, the county council and MCPS was really concerned about that $45 million. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we had the expenditures cut off earlier this year. We did it at the end of April. We moved it up about two, two weeks to ensure that we were able to save more than the $25 million and shift some items to ESSER, uh, just one-time expenses to ESSER. Um, so that's how we came up with a $35 million that we felt comfortable that we could meet, that it was a realistic number as opposed to the $45 million uh, budget. Uh, next slide, please. So then this is the April 22 financial report uh, that was uh, submitted to the board on June 27th. And as of right now, we are projecting, um, actually the end of year balance for FY21 was $31.3 million. Uh, we used $25 million of that to fund uh, the FY22 budget, leaving us with a start FY22 fund balance of $6.2 million. We've had revenue deficit of about $2.9 million. That includes a non-public uh, revenue deficit, uh, which leaves us with an FY22 projected expenditure balance of $33 million. Um, and then we are gonna use, or something, we're going to use $35 million to, uh, of that money, of the six minus the two plus the 33, uh, to fund next year's budget, leaving us with a projected a start of year fund balance as of 7122 of $1.4 million, which means then that that's the start of that $25 million balance that, that we'll need for FY24. That's, that's what that accounts for. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just the overview of SR3 as of 5-11-2022. Uh, I'm sorry, SR3. 
what is this? Sorry, that's just part of it. That's categories two, three, four, and five, as you can see. And then if you would go to the next slide, is the rest of the SR3. So as of right now, we still have about $196 million from the $252 million that we were allocated uh, left in ESSER to spend. But remember that we still have FY23, FY24, and the beginning of FY25 uh, to spend ESSER3. And we want to make sure that we spend ESSER1 and ESSER2 before we um, spend most of SR3, especially those programs that overlap between all the grants. Uh, but the good news is that the only place where we really have positions is in SR3. SR1 and SR2 are really one-time um, one um, items. It, it's, it's not, we don't anticipate a, a funding clip as a, as a result of SR1 and SR2. Um, and um, now if you have any questions, uh, we'll be glad to answer them. Dr. Dafka, Dr. Joff, just any questions? Um, <clears throat> it's really not, well, it's not a big question, but I know that we used to get um, monthly reports uh, at board meetings about how much was spent in transportation or <clears throat> in instructional. I thought they were pretty interesting because you could see if they'd spent too much or if they were able to save and to stay within the budget. So I didn't know what happened to those. Was I don't, I just don't know. Yeah, and we can revisit that, Dr. Doctor. If it's something that's not in our current, what we're currently doing, we can look at that because um, um, it sounds like there was a benefit to that. So in addition to financial monitoring for um, the items we mentioned, you're talking about specific monitoring within transportation, for instance, correct? Yeah, okay. Some of the categories would overspend. They'd have to because gasoline went up and that was transportation. And there was another category in there that was always uh, shifting. Uh, but I, I don't know. For me, it was interesting just to see those round numbers. And Again, part of that you'll see when we do our categorical transfer, our, like it basically kind of culminates the financial monitoring process. We're going to be doing that in August of where we fell with each of those categories. We'll get into more detail there, too. And I think it's it's traditionally it's been a consent item agenda, um, but we, we'd be happy to speak to that um, to give more information regarding that by category. Yeah. Well, if, I, if I could just add to that, um, the, it was actually a um, uh, item that was not on the consent calendar. So the financial report, um, you might remember Dr. Doc and Nikki Diamond or Mr. Bowers would 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 be at the table and go over the financial report in detail. Um, but I believe given the, the board's large agenda each month, that was moved to the consent calendar. So um the same report that uh, you were getting six, eight, ten years ago is the same report that you're getting um, currently. Um, it's just on the consent calendar. And, and if time allows, I'd be happy to go through it in, in any given month just to provide more um, detail if that's thank what the board wants. Thank you for that information. Dr. Justice. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious um, about um, the, uh, what challenges you would identify, like the top challenge you would identify with regard to sort of the tracking and spending and tracking of ESSER funds outside of the, impen the pending um, cliff. Um, are there any other particular challenges that you all face in terms of using those funds um, uh, impactfully and tracking their use um, so that down the road we'll be able to assess their, their impact? I think some of the challenges are, um, so let me go back. Uh, when we track grants, we usually track them, you know, like you see by category, but we're also tracking them by program, uh, the ESSER grants, which is a little different than how we do our financial monitoring. So um, some of the challenges are making sure that we're tracking it both ways, that we know what the programs are expending specifically in the grant 
because these grants cover multiple programs as opposed to usually the Title I, which is one program, IDEA, which is one program. These grants cross the entire system in a way. Um, so I think those are some of the challenges, but we're um, you know, making sure that's what we're making sure that we're tracking it that way. And also once we do amendments, right, because these are fluid uh, uh, funding that we can make an amendment. And if we decide that a program might need a little bit more funding than the other, just making sure that we keep track of that, right? That, that we that we know when we do amendments and that we change the purpose of the funding, making sure that we track that and, um, you know, the impact that it's having. Is there, thank you, is, is there anything that you could use from the board in terms of help that would, that would make that any easier or more effective? I think it's making sure that we understand your priorities, you know, that if anything changes, you know, uh, that that would be very helpful. You know, uh, one of the things that we're really looking at, obviously, is summer school. Uh, summer school has been a program that in the past have, has been um, not completely enterprise, but students have had to pay fees for it. So I think, you know, making sure that um, we understand what the priorities are. Obviously, this summer is going to be fully funded by SR3 uh, by end of and and it might be that that's one of the programs where we might have to do amendment and shift funding so that we're able to fund it, you know, next year as well through the SR3. So well, making sure that we understand your priorities. That's actually an excellent example, the summer school priority, because I think we would most of us would say that that is certainly part of our. Um, uh, priority as far as um, equity and improving outcomes of students that where achievement has gone down as a result of the pandemic. The problem was there was data, I think, um, at, a, at a, a board meeting that showed that the um, expenditures for summer school last summer were not affected. They, they did not result in a positive impact. And that's the kind of work which was excellent work by the way you know that's no one's fault everyone was working quickly it was a pandemic we were doing the best we could to get as many kids in there as possible but it's super helpful now to know that that didn't work and now i think the question is why and um, i'm not sure we're quite able to answer those types of questions yet and that's kind of where i'm trying to push us um because it's certainly intuitively summer school makes tons of sense if we're trying to close achievement gaps and and address the lost learning time resulting from the pandemic um, but without that understanding of why it hasn't worked in the past and what if anything we're doing to change that that's that those are sort of the questions that i have sure and i think and i know for this summer for this summer school they're doing more targeted uh, there's a more more targeted approach so hopefully now that we'll have two summers and data from two summers we'll be able to uh you'll be able to um get into that you know to that analysis thank you yeah and i just have i think two very quick questions um and or maybe the first one is more of a comment so i appreciate that you were talking uh, Ms. alfonso windsor about you start your month to month, you know, measuring of, you know, actual versus budgeted in October because the first big year is September. And some of the comments that, you know, some of the discussion we've had at the board table over the past 10 months or so has gone to, we, we create the budget we need, but that, you know, 93, 92, 93% of that budget goes to people. And so we're budgeting for positions, whether we can fill them or not, whether we can find those psychologists, or whether we can find those special educators, they're in the budget. And so the work that you're doing on a monthly basis goes to reconcile what we budgeted for and what we're actually spending. And that's important. And I just, you know, that's the first observation. And the uh, question there is, so I know for the past several years, we have been working to completely overhaul and upgrade our business systems. And one of the improvements it was is to come from that, and I, I don't know if it has rolled out yet or not, went to the impact on employees. So one was getting rid of the silly paper timesheets, which will eventually happen. But the other was, would we be able to more robustly convert from 10 months to 12 months um, pay, payments for, for those employees that even if they're a 10 month employee would prefer those payments to be spread out over time. And so how would that impact as you were saying you really start that budget analysis in October, because those salaries really pick up 
in September with all of our 10 month teacher employees and paraeducator employees and lunchroom employees and things like that. We will have to look at obviously look at it a little bit differently. Um, you know, we so let me make sure, let me clarify, although we start the official process in October, it doesn't mean that the budget office is not currently running reports to see how many vacancies, right, and so on. Um, you know, so we would continue to do all of that. The key piece also about September, right, is it's when we make sure that as many of the vacancies are filled. People, you know, teachers are still moving sometimes from school to school. Sometimes we're still filing vac filling vacancies and so on. So that will be extremely helpful in a way that you know we'll have a better idea earlier on about where we will be i don't think it will change our process that much at that point um you know but it all depends if 90 percent of our employees choose to get paid over a 20-month period obviously that will have a big impact you know on how we look at at, at uh, salaries as well and um, I just want to also clarify in terms of, you know, vacancies and so on. When we do our budget analysis, though, we account for a lot of those vacancies, you know, during the budget development process as well. It's not just through the financial monitoring process. Hey, Ms. Harris, I just wanted to add to, because um, we'll be talking about at our next fiscal management committee meeting, but uh, the, the processes you're talking about is, is the final phase of our um, ERP implementation called uh, HCM, Human Capital Management, and those things will be addressed in that. And we plan on going live with that uh, a year from this January, January 2024. Uh, the phases that we've already done would be the financial and the budget pieces. So we're already seeing um, efficiencies in those processes as well, so, as uh, Ms. Alfonso Windsor mentioned. Uh, I think it's easier for folks in the field and departments and divisions to get their data into the system that we're pulling from. So we're seeing benefits already, and you know we hope to see that uh, when the, this process culminates. Thank you, and you know really appreciate all the work that you all do on this um, year in and year out. Um, okay, so next um, I think on our agenda is um, uh, item seven point one, the uh, Blueprints Accountability and Implementation Board. I think we're going to. Um, I saw uh, Ms. Bucky. Early. Oh, there she is. Hello. <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, I think there's a PowerPoint coming up as well. Good morning. I'll give you the latest update um, on the accountability and implementation board. Um, for those who um, are watching, there are five. We can go to the next slide. For those who are watching, I just wanted to provide a quick reminder about the five policy or pillar areas of the blueprint. Um, and so early childhood education, high quality and diverse teacher leaders, college and career readiness pathways, more resources to ensure all students are successful in governance and accountability. Um, next slide. Okay, here's an update on the accountability implementation board. Um, for those who are watching, it is the newly created entity that was brought about as a result of the Maryland's blueprint uh, for the future legislation. The accountability and implementation board, also known as the AIB, has uh, been adding some additional staff um, to uh, a policy director and an implementation director on their staff. And so they're starting to really um, work on certain deliverables and training that will be up forthcoming. They will have three virtual sessions that are open to the public um, and they will be held. They will have Kerwin Commission members who will provide background information on recommendations. The AIB will have some staff prepared materials and they'll be prepared to discuss and clarify expectations, sequencing timeline, implementation metrics, and milestones to inform on the draft blueprint implementation plans. Um, each uh, jurisdiction in Maryland will be required to, uh, to submit a final blueprint implementation plan that relates to those five policy areas. That final date will be March of 2023. So the AIB will be having some forthcoming sessions to clarify their interpretation of the statutes and to have some discussions around the policy areas. All of these sessions can be accessed through the General Assembly website and YouTube. Uh, the dates listed below are the dates that they will be discussing each of those particular policy areas. Next slide. 
Okay, the AIB staff, the Maryland State Boards of Education, Maryland State Department of Education, local education agencies, and other stakeholders will review the differences in interpretation of the blueprint law or its intent. They will further discuss what good implementation looks like on any of the implementation issues. They will develop solutions to issues that were raised but not resolved and identify any issues that arise to the level where the AIB may recommend statutory change. Um, so this is going to be um, an opportunity for um, folks to hear directly from the AIB uh, regarding the statutes and what their expectations are. Um, the blueprint requires some pieces of information to be given to the Maryland State Department of Education and some pieces of information to be reported directly to the Accountability and Implementation Board or the AIB. So this, these uh, series of uh, planning sessions are going to be the voice of the AIB. They will have further trainings um, and informational sessions that will be held throughout the rest of the summer. They're generally going to be on Thursdays. They have not announced those dates as yet, but we're hoping to get some further clarification. Um, there are a number of issues under each of the policy areas that we are wanting to get some clarification around um, in order to move forward in our work and to work with stakeholders and to clarify those some of those issues. Next slide. There will also be uh, AIB fall work group sessions um, in the formation and dissemination of the blueprint plan criteria for jurisdictional reporting. And so this is really how the process and the timeline will work going forward. Uh, in September, uh, the full AIB will review and discuss a completed draft of the implementation plan. In October, they will publish that for public comment. In November, they'll hold public hearings. Um, they will take testimony. We can um, support any, um, we can present any questions, issues, concerns, implications, and then they will revise the plan as needed. And then in December, by December 1st, they will release the full implementation plan criteria. And then by March 2023, our final blueprint plans are due to MSDE and the AIB. That doesn't take away from our interim reporting that we need to do in the meantime, but this is the timeline for when we're going to have to work on our full plan. And there are still a number of questions that are unanswered. So we're hoping that in these next sessions over the next month, and through the summer that we'll get some clarifying information. Next slide. One of the things that is new um, that has come about um, uh, as a result of the uh, blueprint is that um, when we're talking about early childhood education and expansion, there is a new template for the memorandum of understanding between public, um, between private providers and the public school system and the State Department of Education. Um, so we have approximately eight private public partnerships uh, with community providers who are funded by the state for uh, pre-K. In the past, the provider and the school system developed an individual MOU. Now MSDE, um, under the auspices of the blueprint, has developed a new template which must be used um, in terms of um, the, the partnership agreement for state-funded pre-K. It's an understanding that exists now between MSDE, the private provider, and MCPS. Um, it clarifies the expansion of access for state-funded pre-K and identifies the ages and income guidelines. Um, it includes agreements and assurances for MSDE providers and MCPS. The effective date is July 1st, 2022 through July 30th, 2023. And these will be developed or renewed on an annual basis. And then there will be an addendum due in September, which includes additional pieces, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, the new MOU template includes uh, confidentiality measures are written into the template. Uh, the partnerships are now evaluated with measurable goals, which will need to be developed between MCPS and the private providers. And there has to be a plan for data collection and sharing of information related to progress and achievement of public versus private students. So that's something that will have to be worked out in terms of um, parental permissions and other things to uh, be able to look and uh, compare uh, the progress of the students in each of those environments. Next slide. 
At a minimum, the MOU will provide for the answer to the question, how will children with disabilities, English language learners, and those who are homeless be best served within the program partnership? Um, I've, I've highlighted this piece because this template and this question um, represents a significant change um, in the expectations. So under the blueprint, under this new template, it shifts the some of the structure and responsibility for the monitoring of English language learners, homeless students, and those with disabilities from the private provider over to MCPS. Um, it relies on MCPS for um, more technical assistance, um, working with the kindergarten readiness data, providing professional development, some curriculum services, um, access to understanding about the structure of child find, uh, data collection pieces, guidance and services to parents, of English language learners, as well as homeless children, screening of English language learners. So it does represent a significant change in terms of the responsibility and the structure moving over to the school system, especially for the monitoring of subgroups of children. So when you think about the implications of that, right now we have approximately eight partnerships, but as we move forward over the next few years to develop this mixed uh, delivery system, where 50% of the state funded pre-K slots must be in private community-based programs, then we may see more of an impact in terms of the resources that we need to provide um, in order to support these private public uh, partnerships for pre-K. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, it also, um, the, M the new MOU template also provides a process by which parents are able to indicate their preferences for pre-K pre programs and providers. We're already working closely with the private providers so that there really is a uniform uh, recruitment and registration process, whether the student is, whether the parent wants the pre-K student in a community-based or in a public school. Um, the manner for the processing of payment for the state share, local share, and family share for each one enrolled with an eligible pre-K provider. And right now, the state is providing the funding, funding directly to the community-based providers through a grants process. So there really isn't any money passing through from the providers to the school system right now in terms of um, those individual grants. But in the next few years, that process may change. And MSDE says they will provide a, a way, a manner in which they can continue to fund the providers. Um, any agreed upon administrative costs? Oh, uh -oh I think our slides just went out. That's all right, I can still, I can still go forward. Um, any agreed upon administrative costs, um, the manner in which all parties will meet the requirements. And then by September, there has to be a plan to address racial and so socioeconomic integration in pre-K classrooms, a plan to avoid disproportionate concentration of students of the same race, ethnicity, disability status, and household income. And this MOU has been reviewed um, with the providers, the county government, and, and CPS staff. So there are some additional um, implications in terms of resources and the need for extra resources that will increase for MCPS over the next few years. Thank you. And I'll see if there are any questions. Any questions, Dr. Daka, Dr. Joftis? Yeah, I have one about, if you don't mind, a plan to address the racial and socio socioeconomic um, integration in pre-K classrooms? Have we been doing that routinely? Well, um, right now we have been, based on the, the state guidelines, we have been using the income eligibility guidelines. And so um, that tends to lead to a homogeneous group of children because you're using the income, the household income as one of the measures, as a primary measure for identifying those students. But we, um, as the blueprint continues over the next few years, it allows for us to slowly tear out increasing students um, in the program whose families earn between 300 to 600% of the federal poverty level. And those students may be able to um, provide, their families provide some tuition on a sliding scale basis. So they're trying to slowly increase the numbers of children from low income to also working working income households or maybe that may also have just lower income or middle income to be able to include those students. The other thing that I want to, to, to mention regarding that is that when we look at the possibility of other federal funds, 
working with the county government and looking at working parents assistance, subsidies, and other types of pilots that they're looking at right now. There's been a very strong effort um, that we're coordinating together to look at how we're going to help to provide some wraparound services for some of the children and how we can try to um, still meet the guidelines, but look at some other ways to blend and braid the funds so that we can make it as, as broad as possible in terms of the, the eligibility of the students and still meet the requirements. So we are having lots of discussions around that right now. Yes. Well, thank you, because all I could think of was how are we going to move those kids around because they're talking about socioeconomic background and we know that only, well, there are a group of students or two students, two groups of students that are in that category. So it would be hard to, but you're explaining how they're planning to do it. And right. Well, I think we're planning that as a county. We're trying to control for that. I'm not so sure the state has really given us the some direct guidance on how we might go about doing that. But I think it is an issue for us in the county as a whole. So we're working to find some ways that we can do that. Mr. Joctis. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just briefly, please. Um, do we have a projection for the increasing costs we're expecting over the next few years um, as a result of blue, blueprint implementation? Um, as a whole or just for this early childhood piece? I would say as a, yeah, as a whole, I would, I would ask. Okay, I think, and you mentioned that earlier in terms of impact analysis, and I think that's something that we can continue to work on. We're trying to, in some instances, for example, let me use the career ladder as an example. So, so sorry, I just want to be clear. So I, I do, I am curious about impact analysis, but for right now, my question is really just, do we have a handle on from a budgeting standpoint, what the implications over, let's say the next five years are going to be? I think, we're, I think that's something that we're continuing to work on. And I think, and I'm gonna let, let Mr. Riley answer, but the other piece to that is that, for example, the career ladder, we won't get the full guidance on that until December. And that has to do with um, incentives, um, increased salary costs um, and other pieces that are built in as incentive for staff. So until we have that exact guidance, I think we can have a ballpark figure, but um, until we know some of those things that the actual interpretation of the statute and the other pieces they fill in, we won't fully know what that is. And I think the other thing is we're, we're looking at some of the trends and increases in, for example, the National Board Certified Teachers so, you know, there are some trends that you can project uh, for the future. So there's some pieces that I think we solidly can make a prediction about. And then there's some other pieces that we may be still waiting for some guidance. And that guidance may, could, could impact uh, the, the financial responsibilities. And yeah, it's a great point, Dr. Doth. There's just a, a follow up. So normally we do a one year operating budget, right? But due to blueprint, um, we are looking at doing a three to five year, as as, as Janine mentioned, as that uh, information comes in, so we can make a, a better projection, but we do wanna build that into our multi-year forecast. I, I think it might help the board as we're starting, um, as you're starting next, year, next year's budget um, discussions. If we could start, if we could um, put together a, just a very simple overview of all the um, all the expected areas of increase, and then to the extent that we can start filling in what those expectations are. And of course, if we don't know them yet, just to leave that. But I think it will help us um, understand that there are going to be some pretty significant implications um, going forward. Great point. Absolutely. Any other? Oh, wait. And so I have a couple of quick questions. So the first goes to um, the CTE piece. Um, and I guess my main question is logistical. Um, I know from being a CTE instructor that uh, arcane MSDE rules around graduation credit requirements place real obstacles in the in students' way if they want to pursue, especially a, a multi-sequence CTE program. And so as this rolls out and um, there, you know, I'll be watching with interest um, the, these three upcoming meetings, but um, 
as this rolls out, it looks like in November, public hearings, that would be a time to raise those concerns directly. Just want to make sure I have that on my radar. I don't want to miss it. Absolutely. And I can touch bases with you before then. There are um, existing work groups around the state of blueprint coordinators and subgroups working on each of these areas, sharing the feedback and information to MSDE, as well as will be shared with the AIB. So we will touch bases before then and make sure we're including all of those pieces. But we've got sort of a um, an idea about um, information that should go forward, concerns, questions, clarifications before the public comment period. Yep, we'd like some very specific pragmatic um, suggestions based on experience and a very in-depth uh, review of the 2018 graduation uh, task force and their recommendations. So yeah, I will be watching that very closely. Uh, and then a uh, quick question on, so, and this is a little bit of a segue that will build into uh, Mr. Adams' comments on the CIP coming up. Um, Okay, could place significant challenges on our on our capacity, and so I was listening, watching with interest. And you were you mentioned that that currently the state is requiring fifty percent of the pre K providers to be um, private and community based. Is that something? It's, that it's thirty percent by next year, and then by FY twenty five, fifty percent of the state funded pre K slots should be in community based programs. They're actually very, there are a number of, of jurisdictions that are not going to be able to meet that, um, but we will be, be able to meet the 30% by the fall and we're continuing to try to recruit additional providers, um, provide orientation sessions, um, make them aware of what uh, state grants are available to help support certification. And then also trying to work with the college to look at some of the pathways for existing providers who want to become certified and to help paraeducators who need to meet the associates requirement by FY26. Yeah, because looking at that base, but also we have the most important piece here is the accountability. Wanting to make sure that the pre-K programming is being developed robustly and with fidelity and is achieving the results for which all this money is Absolutely. being spent. So that ongoing monitoring of both the public and the private providers, private and county could in a fluid way, have impact on our um, MCPS capacity for pre-K, especially, and then looking at the numbers over time. So, um, well, there is a um, there are a group of eight providers that we're working with right now, um, and they will be continuing for next year. And there already is a strong partnership between the Early Childhood Office and these providers in terms of technical assistance, professional development. Um, so the state is monitoring them, and we're not really a monitor for them, but we're more so a partner but we do provide a robust set of uh, skills and support. All to show why having an accountability and implementation board for this massive investment in young people is important. Absolutely. Okay, any other questions, Dr. Daka, Dr. Joftis? Okay, um, moving on, our next thing, uh, internal audit, Ms. Bergstresser. Good morning, thank you. Um, I have a PowerPoint and I'm here to talk about the updated annual report of the internal audit unit. Um, and I know we're close on time, so you did get a copy of the report and I'll just go through this and then leave some time for questions. So on to the next slide. So basically it's broken out into five broad categories that we look at at our responsibilities, the management and coordination of all the external audits financial and compliance audits and reporting. We do operational audits, assist managers and staff, and we do investigations. And I will discuss each one briefly. So next slide. The first one is management and coordination of the external audit. So every year we have an annual audit from an external audit company um, and I help coordinate that and then we pull together the annual statements and that goes to the board and, and gets published. So some of the state audits we do is the Maryland State Department of Education, which is MSDE, and that's done every two years. And the last one was completed May 21st, 2021. The next one I assist with is the Office of Legislative Audits, and that's OLA, and that audit is done every six years. And the last audit uh, was just completed this May. So those are some of the audits that we help with. Um, the next slide is financial and compliance audit. The main thing that we work on is the independent activity 
funds. We also audit the CIF, which is a centralized investment fund. And then we also help with the consolidation of the school financial statements for the inclusion in the NCPS annual comprehensive financial report, which we call ACFR. Um, so those are some of the things that we did. This year we did 90 IAF audits. Um, and I have a slide that's going to talk about it, but basically um, we look at all of their activities, disbursements, money that's coming in, activities. Obviously, with the pandemic, we had a lot less activity, but FY22, the schools did get back to having some activity, but not as much as they normally do. Um, for the CIF, we have um, approximately 202 schools that have accounts, and we had approximately deposits of 3.5 million. And the balance as of May 31st was approximately 12 million, 12.4 million um, in the CIF. So unfortunately, the interest rate did go down to 0.12 um, in that. So the next slide. So of the 90 audits that we did, this shows you which ones. So for zero findings, we had 13 schools that had zero reportable findings. We also had 12 schools that had no current findings and had not had findings in their prior audits. Um, we, for one to three findings, we had 34. For four to seven, we had 26. And then we had five schools that had eight to 13. Um, so that kind of shows you a broad range of, you know, obviously the middle is one to three, which is what we're shooting for. And we're really working with the schools that are in the four to seven and definitely the schools that are in the eight to 13. So the next slide. So this is what we consider the clean as a whistle audit. These are the 25 schools that did not have any audit findings. And the ones with the asterisk are the ones that had two or more consecutive audits with no findings. So, um, you know, we would obviously like that to increase, um, but, you know, 25 is a pretty good number. Um, the next slide. So for operational audits, that includes payroll, cell tower, and student parking. Obviously, payrolls are big money, so we do try to get into the schools and some offices to look at their payroll to make sure that they're in compliance and people are getting paid properly and everything is being done accordingly. So we do try to do as many of those as we can, and we do audit the cell tower to make sure that the distribution of the cell tower money is done properly, and we do look at schools that have parking, which is just the high schools, and we basically do an analysis of the parking permits or the number that they got, the number that they sold, and compare that to what they returned to make sure that the money matches. And we're working on that audit um, currently. And then the next slide is the assistance to managers and staff. And we spent a lot of time helping schools. We update the financial manuals that we're in charge of. We do a physical inventory testing out at the five bus depots. We check parts, tires, uh, fuel. So we make sure that that, you know, their testing is accurate. We also work on the independent activity fund accounting software updates. And at this point, our accounting software is called SFO. And we are implementing a cloud based online school payment, um, which we'll call SCO, which is full cash online and will be um, implementing that this summer where we're hoping to get a large majority of all parent payments online instead of bringing the money to the school. So the goal is to get the money out of the school and have people pay online. So that's we've been working really hard on that project. And then some of the other things we work on, uh, we do school finance training for principals and financial agents. Um, anytime people need support, we're there for them. We can help them with JP Morgan issues whatever they're having issues with and, you know, just phone calls and emails, you know, answering questions and, and helping. The next slide. 
is we work on investigations. We have a hotline that we monitor um, and we work with the compliance and investigation department on that. So sometimes schools will request an audit or an office will request an audit. We've had directors request audits um, and we'll go out and do those kind of things. We also look at the tip line and, and investigate what the um, complaints are. A lot of times there are things that you know are easily resolved and don't really result in any audits being done. And then if we do an investigation, um, we do report that to the superintendent of American Public Schools. So briefly, quickly, that is the update on the report. And the next slide, if there's any questions, I know there's some audio issues. I'm not sure why, but could be because I'm housed in the basement. So any questions, Dr. Daka or Dr. Joftis? So I just want to say, uh, Ms. Bergschusser, thank you. I mean, I've read the report and I appreciate the ongoing way that you work to support, you know, when when the fi you, findings, when it's clear that staff aren't quite following all the rules. Um, and then um, I guess just use this as coming attractions. So in your report, you also mentioned the um, uh, every six, minimum of every six years, the state um, comes in and does a complete review of um, how well, uh, how effective and efficient our financial management practices are. We'll, we'll be going over that in great detail in September, so. Yes, Rob will have that fun. Thank you. Um, okay, now moving on, uh, Mr. Adams, welcome. I hope the promotion ceremony was fun and joyful. Um, so anyway, first thing, CIP, and we kind of talked just a tiny bit about the one of the pressures we have. Um, as uh, the pre-K, but yes, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the flexibility today. Uh, it was a great promotion ceremony. So uh, great, great work to MCPS, uh, teachers and staff and principals. Um, so just diving right into the CIP. I, I know, um, you know, we, we've read a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the press releases that have recently come out. Um, ultimately, what, what was just previously just recently approved by the county council was a $1.77 billion capital budget. That certainly seems like a large budget. Um, however, there, there were several delays. There were several caveats to that as we navigated some of the reconciliation. Um, we did see uh, delays beyond the non-recommended reductions within the, the, you know, what staff had sent over to the council. They were at Magruder and Wooten. Um, the delays, uh, the non-recommended delays did hold at the other facilities, uh, particularly uh, the Woodward opening, uh, as well as the Crown reopening. Um, and then there was a, a few other uh, smaller scale, Highland View, obviously Burtonsville. Uh, the one thing with Burtonsville was the, the council did move planning dollars up into next year. So we're able to start some of that work, uh, with the community conversations with Burtonsville. Uh, we'll be hopeful that we can really um, engage with uh, both the county executive and county council through the summer and the fall to, to restore those funds. Um, just to give a, a high level uh, CIP update, um, you know, similar to uh, to to uh, Mr. Riley in the operating budget, you know, you you get to the end the end line with approval, um, and then you're starting all over again. So this this summer is a heavy lift to work through. Um, understanding all the new dynamics that, that are certainly coming our way, everything from what we heard in the blueprint. Um, you know, and what, what I would say on, on that is, yes, there are elements that are going to be extremely CIP intensive, meaning we need space. Um, just the notion of full day pre-K, uh, you know, will be pretty significant to, to us from a space dynamic. So yes, we, we will continue to, to work um, you know, with our with our colleagues uh, as they navigate through Blueprint, and obviously with Mr. Riley from an operating perspective, but there will be uh, some priority shifts for us as we start to implement this. Um, you know, particularly when you think about obviously the the elements of community schools, you think about the elements of um, you know CTE programs. They're very space intensive, and these are things that we have to plan for in a, well in advance. Uh, you know, to make sure that the space is there and everybody's up and running. Uh, for when obviously final implementation gets here. So that is going to be a, a, a quite a bit of the work that we're going to conduct this summer as we as we map this out um, and obviously work with the superintendent on on any recommendations amendments uh, to the FY 23-24 uh, you know, CIP. 
Um, other things that we are going to be continuing to monitor are our cost increases. You know, so I, I you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily I'm not going to pretend that I'm this this economist that says it's going to either come up or it's going to go down. I think you know we've all hoped, at least from a supply chain, from a from a capital, from a construction perspective, to level off. We have not seen it. It's only continued to climb. Uh, the uh, the latest um, you know bid project is the Nailsville project, which uh, thank you to the Board of Education for. Uh, approving that project and also uh, recommending and approving the supplemental appropriation request. Uh, the project did come in over budget, uh, and we are working with council members who are very supportive of that project. But that's just one more example of of where we are and where we continue to see the escalating costs. Uh, it is pretty miraculous when you think about that we are able to get under contract ten projects in these unprecedented cost times. Um, but with that, there are obviously caveats as we continue to see these projects develop. I think about projects phase two of Woodward, Northwood, Crown. Um, there will become a point if, if costs continue to rise, uh, county revenues, state revenues will not be able to support. You know, if you think about a, a high school project costing $250 million, uh, when when just three short years ago, we thought, 150 at, at uh, Seneca Valley High School was the largest we would ever see and the most expensive we'd ever see. Add 100 million dollars to that is just absolutely not something that um, can be supported from from a revenue and from a from a state perspective. So, so as we work through this this summer and the fall, we will be talking about we will be keeping close tabs on what the costs are. Um, obviously, we're, we're into Plan B, Plan C, Plan D that we will obviously bring to, to the board for consideration. I, I do think we will have to be very creative as we move forward. You know, we may have to start looking at properties different. We may have to start looking at space very differently than what we've, what we've been accustomed to. Um, and, and those things are, are all elements that will take the support of the county executive, county council. So those partnerships are going to be extremely important as we move forward through uh, for future CIP work, um, but even though there are uh, concerns, there are you know we are very optimistic about the projects we are starting. We're going to do quite a bit of community engagement this this uh, summer fall uh, around projects like Burtonsville, around Joanne Lulick, around the eleven um, uh, feasibility study projects you know that we have included. Projects like Twinbrook, um, you know projects like Damascus Elementary. You know, those are all exciting projects that we definitely are, are looking forward to engaging with our communities um, through the hard work that the board has put into to request and capture those funds. Um, and also to start to think very differently about our work in ADA sustainability. We received significant fund, funding increases in those two categories, um, much deserved categories. So that is gonna be exciting work that uh, we will continue to work with the board and, and provide routine updates as, as those programs evolve and as uh, as our work evolves. So that's the CIP as a as a quick snapshot. Um, I would strongly recommend, you know, as as we sort of think through some of these unprecedented times that we have the opportunity to provide more routine updates and, and certainly fiscal management committee is is, is a good uh, candidate for that, um, for us to be able to provide you with market conditions and trends and and forecasts, I, I do think will be critically important as we uh, talk through any CIP adjustments um, as we move into the fall and to the next spring. So that's the uh, the update that I have. Certainly open it up for any questions. All right, any questions? So I would just say, I mean, um, Mr. Adams, you and I had a little bit of a conversation about this. I think it's gonna be criti critically important for this committee to keep a much to be much more active and 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 to keep a much closer eye on the CIP trending and opportunities and challenges going forward than we than we have typically, um, and I very much appreciate your um, you know looking at you know your your candidness. We need to be looking at all of our opportunities to keep these programs on track. We can't keep up with these kinds of cost overruns with the the funding landscape that we're we're faced with. So we're going to have to do other things and be open to other things. And um, you know, when we looked at um, the bond share that this system has received has been dropping um, over time, and so that's another you know kind of fiscal challenge. But you know, we just have to keep that on the landscape, and it's it's just a reality. And so 
you know, we're going to have to be very um, collaborative with our county partners um, and open to um, looking at things that maybe we haven't had to actually do more than talk about in the past to keep our projects moving forward. So very much appreciate that. Um, okay, and now I think the last thing we have on our agenda is talking about the indoor air quality work that was, uh, it came up at our uh, board meeting last week in the public comment section. And I think um, we're not, I mean, COVID is not done with this. I think we're gonna see quite a spike in the fall based on trending around the globe. So the indoor air quality is gonna be important to what we do to keep our people in our buildings safe. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, just as, a, as an update, we have, have been working very closely with MCCPTA um, you know, one of the, the elements to that uh, partnership has uh, a different approach to how we monitor and how we report out conditions. So uh, we are in the mid middle stages of that RFP that we've talked about, which is to monitor, you know, CO2 conditions, monitor, you know, particulates in, in classrooms. Um, this week, uh, we are working with the variety of partners that have submitted and there will be pilots uh, for folks to, uh, to to put different different technology elements into classrooms and for us to just monitor and, and to understand and make sure it fits and works within our structure. So uh, we, we really are optimistic that we'll have this work moving forward this fall. And, you know, I think the, the first step of understanding, the first step of communicating and, and working with all those that are involved in air quality is, is the critical part. Um, one thing I would say though, is that, you know, this is a monitoring program. So, you know, when things are need repair, we, we have to make sure, uh, you know, the staff and the technology and the training is there for our, our folks to be able to go in. Um, you know, so that this work this spring has been extremely, helpful for us to rethink and to prioritize in bear quality around our operations and maintenance teams. They've done a fantastic job of, of making sure that uh, we, we are meeting the expectations that um, not only we have for ourselves, but you know, other agencies have put forward in terms of what conditions should look like in schools. Uh, I would say that with more ventilation, with higher filtration, it does tax these systems and you know, for us, we're, we're going to begin to work very close with Mr. Riley with board on making sure service contracts are in place, make sure our staff is trained, make sure that we have the capacity to be able to, to manage uh, the work. It, the other piece I would say, too, and this is this dovetails into our sustainability work. Um, when you think about the indoor quality efforts, uh, they are moving drastically in the opposite direction of our sustainability work in terms of energy and uh, you know, carbon footprint and other impacts. Uh, just thinking about you know, more ventilation, more filtration, all that is taxing. So, so we are exploring other innovative technologies out there that will keep spaces safe. You know, again, a lot of this is emerging technology, so we don't wanna necessarily be on the bleeding edge. We want to make sure whatever we put into our schools uh, will work and it, and it has proven to work. Uh, but we are being very aggressive with these innovative technologies, um, and we will start to see some different pilot opportunities throughout the summer into the fall to think very differently about how we've been approaching this work. So, so I'm very, I'm very excited, you know, about our RFP to monitor and to track data. Um, very excited about the, uh, the the reorganization to place some more greater emphasis on this uh, from a district-wide perspective. And then really excited to see the push from the industry to, to really challenge you know, the different engineering communities and, and other researchers out there to, to just think differently about how do you combine, you don't have to sacrifice you know, indoor quality to have great energy efficiency and vice versa. And really challenging that community to come up with solutions is, is uh, I think a great place where we're at and hopefully we'll be well positioned to take advantage of that in the near future. Thank you. Any questions? Um, and I would just like to say, I mean, I really appreciate the very comprehensive look here because indoor air quality monitoring, as you mentioned, that that's a that's a monitoring. And then what we need to have in place is making sure um, we have the staff that understand how to do the monitoring, how to report the results, what to do with those results, whether it's you know repeat you know repeat testing or implementation of mitigation measures, and then but bigger, wider, how do we do this in a sustainable way? 
um, that is taking advantage of new technology that emerges to not overtax and over increase our carbon footprint because um, we're moving towards, as you have been, um, you know, keeping us apprised of, Mr. Adams, a very um, robust and aggressive sustainability policy, um, which I think is in keeping with our with our um, strategic goals and our um, our priorities as a system. So, um, moving parts there, but you know, keeping um, and and working with the the subject matter experts in our community. I think that's also sort of been a very important piece of this work, being really open to having, to, to embracing that um, wisdom that offers itself to us. Um, so yeah, just keeping our, um, and then I guess one of the things, so we know we do have uh, community folks in the, in the school communities that are very interested in this. So um, think about, I guess, going forward, how we want to make sure we're being very transparent about this piece of the work and ensuring people that, you know, the buildings are going to be safe and ready um, and open when come fall, um, along with sort of the other piece of the work, which is encouraging every school to embrace getting students and stuff outside as much as possible, eat, play, and learn. It's one way to help keep people safe and reduce the burden on our, on our indoor air um, systems. So, and then that little plug. Um, okay, so last thing I think that gets us through. Thank you, everybody. Um, just getting to the very end, are, is there any um, any new business that um, coming from anybody? Okay, our next meeting is currently scheduled for September 20th, 2022, um, after we start the school year. And um, with if there are no further comments or questions, we are adjourned again with my thanks to everybody for all the hard work. Thanks, everybody.